first of all, um, for those of you who might be a bit surprised, I'm actually from the northeast of England originally, uh, which um, often surprises quite a lot of people, especially given the position that I held um, in the uh, US government. But that's um, because of the, um, uh, well, the not-so-special, I guess, relationship anymore with the UK and the US, thanks to Mr. Obama's recent um, uh, pronouncements. But um, there is at least some special areas. <laughs> and um, I um, uh, at least uh, was able to take advantage of those because I'm still a, um, a dual uh, UK-US citizen. And um, it's, uh, I also started off life as a historian. And um, I, for me, um, I just want to say, actually, what a privilege is actually to be here in um, Dublin um, right now on the 100th anniversary of the um, Easter Uprising. So as a historian, I've been wandering around the park looking at all the exhibits and St. Stephen's and um, just remembering you know, those tumultuous events. Because next year will be the 100th anniversary of another big tumultuous event, the Russian Revolution. And an awful lot of questions are about what will that mean um, for Vladimir Putin. Um, we were talking over lunch that there's been a lot of speculation about whether 2017 uh, might become another momentous event because we'll have Duma elections, uh, the elections for the Russian parliament uh, this year in 2016. And in 2018, Vladimir Putin has to go up for re-election again as president. And elections actually do matter in Russia. They matter a lot more than people might think because the nature of the Russian political system is that there is a direct relationship between the president of Russia and the people. Now, Vladimir Putin is directly elected. And he himself has said quite recently that he hopes that St. Petersburg, his hometown, will not be the other scene again of another revolution. So it's also obviously on Putin's mind that there are lots of rumors about um, what happens next. He will have been in power um, by uh, 2018 for 18 years. He'll have been one of the longest serving um, Russian leaders of, uh, of all time. And as uh, you said in the introduction, uh, Russia recently and Russian politics have become all about Putin. And in fact, the nature of uh, the Russian presidential system, a political system now, is, is unprecedented in, uh, in Russian modern history, at least uh, since Stalin. I'm not saying that Putin is Stalin and there's the same kind of cult of personality. But after uh, Stalin um, in the 1950s and onwards, it was a collective leadership in uh, Russia. So it was dominated at various points by the uh, general secretaries of uh, the Communist Party. But there was a really defined collective leadership. And um, obviously, um, under Yeltsin, the presidency was rather weak. Um, and under Gorbachev, uh, we had the great kind of flux of uh, perestroika. Uh, when Putin was in the tandem presidential um, arrangement with uh, his associate Dmitry Medvedev from 2008 until um, 2011, really, when Putin decides he's going to come back again, uh, September 2011, there was quite a striking degree of pluralism in the system. There were all kinds of um, ways in which people could be involved in debates about how Russia was actually governed and where it was going to go in the future. And that's been really dramatically changed uh, since the return of Putin to the presidency in 2012, partly as a reaction to the protests uh, that we saw um, in the streets of Moscow, St. Petersburg, and some of the other cities in between the parliamentary elections of 2011 and the presidential election of 2012. There was a long reaction. There was an idea that that was an uprising, um, Russia's own coloured revolution, uh, that was um, really the perception. But I really think that we're in an unprecedented phase now as a result of everything that's happened over the last couple of years. Russia is now hyper-personalized uh, presidency. First again, for the first time in um, really uh, decades in, uh, of, its, uh, of its modern history. There is still a collective leadership there, and I want to talk about that for um, just um, <clears throat> a few minutes. And I, I'd really like to leave uh, more time for discussion uh, with all of you about um, some of these issues here. But I think the collective leadership around Putin, such as it is, even if it has been you know, somewhat uh, eroded, as I've, as I've mentioned, points in different directions. Because the big question now is if it's so hyper-personalized, if Putin runs for re-election again in 2018 and, and, and gets elected, as people assume he will be, he'll then be president until, until 2024. And he's got to go sometime. He himself was asked at one of that big call-in session on um, April uh, 14th, you know, the big town hall he has where three million people call in and ask uh, questions. They don't all get to get their question answered, but you know, he seems to do a good job of trying to approximate them. Everything from, are you going to fix my road in Tomsk and Omsk and maybe in Dublin? There's lots of roads so here you could fix as well. I've seen quite a few big holes. Um, and then, you know, kind of, what's your relationship like with world leaders? And he was asked about Obama, and did he, did he regret that Obama was going to leave? And Putin said thoughtfully, well, we've all got to go sometime. <laughs> no point in regretting anything. You've just got to keep working. <laughs> 
So that wasn't exactly, you know, kind of, I suppose, what the uh, response uh, was like. But the fact that he'd reflected on the fact that you've all got to go sometime really does uh, lead us to the issue. We're in already the post-Putin era. Somebody's, somebody somewhere is thinking about it. I personally think that Putin's got his own post-Putin plan. But the question is, what is that plan likely to be? There's no way that Putin hasn't thought about the fact that he might fall down a flight of stairs, you know, heaven forbid, or you know, he's a man, you know, kind of of a certain age, things happen, you know. Pres presumably this won't happen, touch wood, and I'm sure that's a lot of people going around the Kremlin with the equivalent of rabbit's foot and four-leaf clovers and, you know, hoping that uh, something, um, something doesn't happen. But they've got to have a plan in place. Initially, the plan would be Dmitry Medvedev for three months and then candidates would emerge for the presidency. But they've got to be thinking about this 24-7. So, you know, what, what could this look like? Is there really a likelihood of an equivalent of a Easter uprising, somebody, you know, kind of basically uh, rallying people from the streets? I think Putin's taken a lot of steps to prevent that from happening. <clears throat> Most recently with the announcement that he's creating a Praetorian Guard, a national guard on the basis of his own personal bodyguard and of some other forces that have now been um, brought together in a kind of a super... Um, paramilitary um, organization under his direct control, under the direct control of his former bodyguard, Viktor Zolotov. There's been a whole consolidation, centralization of other financial and uh, legal uh, oversight uh, entities, which all again suggest that Putin's make it very difficult for some alternate source of power, someone who might have presidential aspirations for being able to you know, tap into um, other uh, entities and uh, you know, the uniform military and instrumentalizing them. So everything points into the um, a direction of uh, a candidate from around uh, Putin's um, inner circle, the collective uh, leadership. And that's why I wanted to talk about that for a moment, because again, the collective leadership in uh, Russia is very interesting. Because there isn't just one single center of, uh, of, of power around Putin um, and, the, and the different people. We all fixate, particularly in the United States, everyone's fixated on the oligarchs, Putin's friends, the guys who played judo with him or when the KGB oh. with him, uh, all the people who are the billionaires or hang out in London you know, and have the, the, the big houses uh, over there. And everyone's uh, so much focused on them that they're not really looking at the other people who are around uh, the presidency. So there are two groups. Putin has actually created, since uh, the annexation of Crimea, the war in uh, Donbass, and then the war with Syria, a kind of a command center, a stavka, as uh, the Russians would call it, high command, I think sort of Churchill in the bunker, with the key people from the security services, the people who have the assets that matter from the armed services, the intelligence and the other security formations, and now this National Guard, in and around him. What we might call the hard men of Russian politics, I'm sure, you know, all, uh, well, many of you will know some of their names. I mean, there is Viktor Zolotov, his uh, former um, head of bodyguard, who's been made a sort of a, a lesser member of the Securities Council, but is still there. But people like uh, Sergei Ivanov, the presidential chief of staff, who was um, minister of defense and who was sometimes been thought of as a potential presidential candidate. Nikolai Patrushev, the, um, who's the head of the Security Council. Sergei Shoigu, the minister of defense. You know, we'll go, go on and on about the kinds of people there. So they seem to be the guys who literally call the shots about you know, who's shooting at whom in Syria, the, the, the military um, aspects of uh, uh, decision-making, <clears throat> what's been happening in Ukraine. A very tight group um, around Putin. They seem to have been the locus of decision-making on Crimea. But then, on the other hand, there is a completely different group that people keep uh, forgetting is still there, which is a, a team of first-rate, world-class economists. And we had one of uh, uh, the members of this team, uh, Ksin Yudayeva, who was actually my classmate when I first got to the US. I was at Harvard and she was at MIT. And she was also a fellow at the Brookings Institution for a while. She did a PhD in economics at MIT. Um, she's had all kinds of uh, different positions on the kind of equivalent of the Presidential's um, Economic Advisory Council. And she's now one of the deputy governors of the, of the central bank. And she was number two at the central bank until the devaluation of, uh, of, the, of the ruble. And the head of this central bank is another woman. This is the only place, actually, there are women, really, in the, um, <laughs> the political system there. I don't think they're likely to be president of Russia, by the way. I'm just putting it out there as a kind of a different uh, group of people, a very Nabiulina. And these are world-class economists. These are people who are running the Russian economy. One of the triggers that is uh, always purported for someone trying to seek to replace Putin is because he's not managing the economy well. Well, Putin doesn't manage the economy. Putin makes it very clear that these people manage the economy. 
I mean, the, the hard guys of Russian politics set the tone, and you know, obviously it's kind of a rather hard tone, but there's a whole group of people who we'd all be quite privileged to have running our economies. Uh, in the US, you know, kind of, we'd actually be quite lucky to have people like this because they're handling debt. They're trying to kind of figure out about how to steward the sovereign wealth funds and the assets, and they're trying to figure out about how to run a central bank and a monetary and financial system in extremis. And they've actually done remarkably well. So the IMF meetings and uh, World Bank meetings were just the last week in um, Washington, D.C., and the consensus there was that the Russian economy is actually doing much better than you would believe from the headlines, and they've done all the right things. And Putin hasn't moved any of them. Their equivalents in politics, who were working around Medvedev in various uh, government think tanks or in task forces for the Kremlin, many of them have left. And of course, uh, the most uh, famous of all of them, Alexei Kudrin, who was the finance minister, resigned famously just after Putin said he was coming back into the presidency. And it looked like, um, you know, first of all, that he'd had a falling out with Medvedev over government spending. But he was obviously displeased with the, uh, the transition um, back and forth. But Kudrin has never gone away. Putin has been out and about. Um, he's been a frequent visitor to um, the US, uh, meeting with um, high-level uh, economists. He's been at Davos. He's been everywhere. And the talk is now that he might go back into a, a senior advisory position uh, for Putin. And again, Putin raised uh, the idea of Putin at uh, this, uh, this meeting. So there are a few other people. Sergei uh, Guriev, who's um, uh, going to be the chief economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, is often cited as someone of these... Uh, first-class economist who's left the country, but there's actually very few. So the reason I'm raising this is that the picture, when you really look at it in Russia, is actually more complicated than it appears. There's a sense that Russia has become, and it's a, a very palpable sense, and there's a lot of reality to it, that Russia has become much more authoritarian, uh, but Russia has not become more autarkic, and the pressure to have a heavier hand in the economy uh, for Russia to close down and to cut off all of its ties uh, with the uh, world economy as a result of the sanctions and the worsening of relationships in many respects with Europe hasn't really happened. And so that raises kind of a big question mark, for me at least, about where is this going to go into the future? Because anybody who wants to replace Putin now, um, I think the bar has been raised even higher. As on the one hand, he's tightened uh, the... Uh, all the reins of the security apparatus around him. It's all in the hands of people who are personally close to him, people who have had close working relationships in the same cohort of men, same rough age, same general background. If they weren't in the KGB uh, with him in uh, Leningrad, St. Petersburg, he's known them since you know, he was a child or he's worked with them um, in the mayor's office in uh, St. Petersburg or as he started his career in Moscow in 96, moving up, or they were, he knew them from Dresden. Um, and then you have this group of technocrats uh, who were brought on by Putin or Kudrin, who of course worked with Putin and was the person who actually helped bring him to uh, Moscow in 1996 in the first place, or they were brought on by Medvedev, and they're still in place. And that's almost sends in defiance if anyone says, well, we need to get rid of Putin because he's not managing the economy, because who could manage the economy better than them? Kudrin hasn't gone anywhere. Sergei Guriev might be the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, but Sergei Guriev alone is not going to you know, suppl um, supplant all of his other colleagues who are still there. So it, it seems you know, even more than difficult to imagine a post-Putin, getting back to what uh, Patrick said, a post-Putin scenario. Because if the accusation is you're not handling the economy, you've got to go, well, you know, I don't manage the economy. These people manage the economy. They're first rate. And then the other question is if there is a disaster... On the security front, um, you know, it's still possible, but Putin has rather deftly, I think, uh, managed to um, maneuver on the issue of uh, Syria. You'll remember that uh, in the United States in particular, uh, there were dark um, predictions that uh, Syria was going to be a quagmire for Russia. Um, President Obama said it openly. This was going to be the next Afghanistan. And that, you certainly heard that from around the region as well. Crimea was one thing, Ukraine was one thing. But moving into Syria, this was definitely um, a real break with the past. Uh, this hadn't been done since the Soviet period in terms of any kind of major um, intervention. And this was uh, bound to uh, lead to disaster. While well, Putin has... Um, uh, we, we know he hasn't gone anywhere, and um, the military, uh, the Russian military is still there, but he you know, did the equivalent of claiming victory and success to withdraw at least expectations back at home in Russia. So that anything that happens now, actually, is more likely to be laid onto the West, 
uh, Secretary Kerry, the United States, were not really managing to pull off the peace talks in, uh, in Syria. So the likelihood of a disaster, a, a major um, event upsetting everything on the security front in Syria has been somewhat reduced. It hasn't been completely eliminated. I think there's lots of things that can go wrong. But it's kind of reduced in terms of uh, the home narrative. The other um, issue, um, just to finish on, uh, that um, I think is, is also kind of important to bear in mind is the nature of this direct uh, relationship between Putin and the electorate, Putin and the Russian population. The Russian population actually marry, matter a lot in Russian politics. They do have traction in the system through their aggregate public opinion and then their opportunity to vote. And the elections are very meaningful because Putin um, is rather obsessed with the law and legality and the constitution. The constitution, the Russian constitution, was drawn up by Anatoly Sobchak, his mentor, the uh, former mayor of uh, St. Petersburg, his boss and his former law professor from uh, Leningrad um, State University. Sobchak um, was not just the first you know, democratically elected uh, mayor of uh, St. Petersburg, Leningrad, but he was actually a very famous legal historian, uh, an expert on Russian constitutional law. Now, if you remember, Russian, um, uh, the Tsarist era, they did never manage to make a constitutional monarchy. But um, Sobchak was an expert on the people who tried, all of the great legal experts of um, Russian uh, legal and political thought who had, who had considered what it would take to create a constitutional monarchy. And Sobchak drew on all that experience when him and his team uh, put together the Russian constitution in the early 1990s. And uh, when I was a much younger person, I actually worked as an assistant to that group. I was the translator uh, for the drafts of the Russian constitution into English because there was a whole host of legal professors in the United States, including Lawrence Tribe at um, Harvard University, who were looking over uh, the, um, the constitutional drafts. And Sergei Shakrai, one of the... Um, a drafters in the group with um, Sobchak, when he was asked in one of these meetings if they had any external foreign models uh, for the Russian constitution, said only the British Queen. In other words, although they didn't kind of quite accept that she didn't really have a lot of powers, but they liked this idea of a constitutional monarch. So ironically, the Russian presidency is a constitutional monarchy, but with direct election. And so for Putin, stepping back from uh, the presidency was very important because there was only two constitutionally approved terms at that point in 2008. Medvedev very handily extended the terms for two years. You might remember he said it wasn't for him, but there was obviously a clear um, idea ahead of that. So he has the constitutional right for two more terms, but he does have to go up for re-election. And Putin's charismatic authority, you know, his ability to keep uh, the popular appeal is the linchpin then as a result of the whole system. Whether he decides to hand it on to someone else and you know, pass on the baton, he has to be able to pass on that popularity because whoever um, basically comes into office has to also be able to get uh, the acclaim of uh, the population through an electoral system. I, I really don't think that he seeks or anyone else seeks to rupture that completely because that constitutionality is the one thing that really keeps uh, the whole system, the whole political system together in the role of the presidency. So the elections in 2018 are going to matter a great deal. And this is where you know, the whole fixation on um, Putin's popularity comes in and on his health and his well-being and his ability to balance everything off and why there is so much anxiety about the idea that his ratings might fall. And if you recall, prior to the Sochi Olympics and the annexation of Crimea, his, his, the trajectory of his ratings was on a downward slope. Now, it was still on a fantastic slope for you know, anybody who's running for election anywhere else. It hit 64% you know, just uh, <clears throat> prior to the Sochi Olympics. But the, the, the trend had been downward from uh, a period uh, prior uh, where he had, had been in the 80%. And this was also um, the uh, real uh, point where it was evident that his popularity was falling as this was a, a trajectory that was only going in one direction was in 2010. 2011, so just in that period that he decides to come back. And it seems very clear that that fear of his waning popularity, even though he was prime minister, that was still the linchpin to the political system because Medvedev never made it up to those kinds of heights, uh, was something that um, was one of the spurs to Putin's return. So whatever happens in the Russian uh, political system, the Russian people will have some impact and will have some say. So as we're starting to think ahead about indicators of where it's going, it's very much like all the debates we're having now about referenda and Brexit and everything else that's going on. What the people vote, what the people say, 
actually has quite an impact. And a lot of the things that you see Putin doing now, not just consolidating these levers of I mean, actual power, are really meant to appeal to the population, to keep the legitimacy of the system, to keep his ratings up, so that even if it's him running again in 2018, it'll carry him through that tricky period. Or if he is thinking somewhere behind the scenes, he's certainly never going to tell us that maybe he might hand off to someone to be able to actually hand over that legitimacy. Because in Yeltsin, when he handed over to Putin, his popularity was rock bottom. His health was a disaster. It was just a miracle that he you know, handed over before he keeled over. I mean, we were talking at lunch about the fact that Yeltsin had had a massive heart attack in between the two electoral rounds and the Russian people didn't know, but everybody outside knew. And there was always that risk in the system that he would just keel over at any time and then that would be at a huge succession crisis. I mean, ironically, he lives for seven years in um, retirement, but that was never a given. There's no way in this kind of system with so much more to lose for everybody here that they want to risk that, uh, that again. So I think we're actually in a very interesting time. On the one hand, it's all about Putin. On the other hand, it's all about what next after Putin. And that's what makes it so difficult to deal with. So I will, um, I will end there and then hopefully we can have a, uh, have a discussion. Thanks so much.